Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 288. I'm your host, Derek Moore. Uh, Jay and I, because of travel again, we are not together on this podcast. He will be back next week, but plenty to talk about. Uh, by the way, I'm recording this early because I have uh, some prior commitments as well. So I'm doing it on just after NVIDIA's earnings came out and plenty to talk about there. It's it's one of those interesting things where like, all right, like is all the news out? We we're waiting for NVIDIA. It's out. They they reported. We we're waiting for Jackson Hole and the Fed to finally say, hey, we're cutting rates. Seems like that's out. Now, the Fed meeting is until September 18th. We're going to find out whether they'll actually do what the implied rate is. You know, so far in this cycle, what the implied rate is, is pretty much, especially if you get closer to the meeting, it's pretty much what the Fed has done. They haven't surprised the street at all. But NVIDIA's earnings are out. And so far, I mean, I'm recording this in the after market. And right now, it's down almost 6% from where it closed. It closed uh, about 125.61. Well, not about. It closed at 125.61 at the end of the regular session. As I'm recording this, it's down to about 118.70. And it was, it's kind of interesting because they beat. They beat their numbers. Uh, they came out with 68 cents for Q2. The estimate was 64 and a half cents. That's a surprise or a beat of 5.47%. Okay, that seems promising. Uh, EPS, their, their gap, uh, 67 cents. Uh, that was a 9.12%. Beat revenue, 30.04 billion with a B. Uh, the estimate, 28.857 billion. That's a beat of 4.1%. Net income, $16.952 billion. That's a beat of 6.2%. So they beat across the board. And, you know, they were saying on Bloomberg TV today, well, maybe the whisper number was a little bit higher. And maybe people were hoping they were going to beat more. I mean, it's it's pretty early. You don't really know until the, the, the regular session. Tomorrow gets underway in the open. I don't know if Jensen has done his press conference, his conference call yet. I know a lot of people were looking to see one of their GPUs. It's called a Blackwell and whether there was news on that. But I think it's worth just putting into perspective how much growth they've seen. And I, I went back and I, I pulled up the revenue and the net income from Q2 of last year. So this is the uh, the earnings report that came out in August of 23. We just had the one today for uh, for Q2 ended July 31st, Q2 that was released today. And I mean, it's it's more than 100% increase in revenue quarter over quarter, year over year. So year over year, Q2, let me be clear about that. 13.5 billion to 30.04, I just told you that. All right, it's more than double. And then you look at net income, net income a year ago for Q2, was I say only 6.28 billion and what did I say 16.5 billion so you know that that's an increase of 162% so you know 162 that's yeah is that a triple no 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 it's not a triple uh so anyway the uh oh, of course not it's not a triple but i mean and the stocks down so this is why sometimes it's really hard to, if somebody is going to play these moves, and I'll talk about the options market and what I was seeing there coming into earnings, but if somebody's going to try and you know, make a bet, I'll just call it a bet, and you're saying, oh, you know, towards the end of the day, I think they're going to beat, they're going to not beat. I mean, they beat. They beat. Was the beat not enough? I don't know. Uh, they gave a little, I think they gave a little bit of forward guidance We'll see how that plays in, but you know, maybe this is one of those deals. I think I used the expression last week. Everybody got something, but not exactly what they wanted. Maybe they wanted something higher. We'll see where the market opens up. And by the way, I'm not saying you should buy Nvidia. You should sell Nvidia. If you want to buy, buy it. If you want to, if you want to sell it, sell it. If you want to short it, I mean, good luck shorting it. Uh, that's pretty volatile stock. If you short a stock, you, you know, you have unlimited loss to the upside. You could hedge it and 
you know, that you could actually short a stock and buy a call to hedge. It would be the inverse. You could short a stock and and sell a covered put, kind of the a different one. And by the way, uh, you know, we we have some uh, uh, some different different things that we actually use that type of strategy. But yeah, I'm, my point is, you know, you just don't know on these things. It is pretty spectacular growth, though, from a year over year basis. I looked at the, let's see, I looked to see what they're expecting in Q3. So that wouldn't come out until August. That wouldn't come out until November. And they're calling for what? 71 cents, revenue of 31.85 billion and net income of 17.56 billion on the quarter. Uh, that's, That's the earnings expectations right now. Those can go up or down. The other thing I was I found was really interesting about this one, and the reason why I'm talking about Nvidia is it's really it's a big part of the S and P right now. We know it's heavily weighted in the S and P. We know it's been on an unbelievable run. I think it's still up 150 percent plus for the year, even with the the pullback in the after hours. And again, that's just the after hours. That's uh, I, I I'm going to oversimplify the after hours, but it's kind of like placing classified ads. There's not necessarily, uh, it's not the same. All right. I shouldn't oversimplify that. I take that back. Maybe I'll, I'll spend some time in the aftermarket at some point. But I, I looked and I saw the gross profit margin. The gross profit margin, if I'm reading this right, 75.15%. 75.15%. And the net profit margin or, or profit margin um, kind of everything accounted for 55.2%. You might remember last week we were talking about the idea of, hey, you know, our our grocery store is making too much money. And I remember we talked about Albertsons. What are the, what was their net profit margin? 1.5%. NVIDIA's got some nice profit margins. By the way, gross profit margin, if you ever want to know the difference between gross profit margin and net profit margin, basically, how should I put this? Imagine you were going to, oh, I don't know. Imagine you were going to sell a, a, a glass of lemonade and you were going to sell it for $10. Wow, that's expensive lemonade, but it's really good lemonade. And imagine that the, the cost of the goods sold or COGS of that $10 you know, sale that you made. Imagine you, I don't know, it was $2 to buy the ingredients. I'm making this up. So what's your net profit? Uh, I'm sorry. All right, let me not do net profit. So gross profit is just takes the $10 and it says, oh, I have uh, $2 in in cost of goods or COGS. So my gross profit is $8. And on $10, that's an 80% gross profit margin. But when you do net profit margin, it's uh, the profit remaining after taking out you know, all the expensive, you're talking about your cost of goods sold, your operating expenses, all that type of stuff, you know, maybe advertising. So imagine you you spent $5 on flyers and then you had this $2 in uh, in costs. So now, you, you know, your net cost is seven, you sold it for 10. Now you're a 30% net profit margin and you had an 80% gross profit margin. Okay. I didn't plan on t- going through that, but Every once in a while, people email me, email me and say, you know, could you just explain that? No one ever really explains it. So there you go. You can shoot me emails, by the way, at Derek.Moore at ZegaInvestments.com. That's uh, D-E-R-E-K dot M-O-O-R-E at Z as in zebra, E as in Eddie, G as in George, A as in Apple. Investments is up to you to get uh, correct. All right. So we spent a little bit of time in NVIDIA. I will. I do want to talk about what was going on in the options market, and so Nvidia didn't have expiration an expiration today. So the the nearest expiration would be the one expiring on Friday. So I'm recording this on a Wednesday, and so what was what was the option market telling us? Well, one is the implied volatility was was pretty high, and that's to be expected. You have a tech stock or a semiconductor stock or one that's pretty big deal as far as the the news cycle. And we know in the past, you've seen the stock, you know, move on on earnings. Uh, I wish I would have written it down, but this morning, I think on CNBC this morning, 
they showed a chart that said, you know, the post one week move, post earnings announcements on NVIDIA, and then like the three month move. And the previous ones, again, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So far in the after hours, it's down. Uh, but, you know, they, they responded really well and they've had some big moves, usually to the higher side after earnings. So I looked at the implied volatility and the implied volatility was 188%. That's high, but that's to be expected. You have an expiration that's coming up on Friday. So after today's close, you know, right at the end of the day, I'm looking at these numbers. There's only two full days left. And the options market's smart. It's You're not going to come in there and be like, oh, I think it's going to move, so I'm going to buy some options and I'll make money either way. Well, those premiums are going to reflect the expectations of the market, the options market for the implied volatility or the expected one standard deviation, two standard devi- deviation moves. So when we say an implied volatility of 188, I know we've gone over this a couple times on the show before, but it's always people say, hey, it's helpful to go through these. You take uh, the square root of 252, which is the number of trading days this year. So that's the actual number of trading days. And when you take the square root of that, it's rounded, you know, 15.875. Unrounded, it's like, I don't know, 16 numbers after that. And you, you take, and that's called the square root of time. And you take 188 divided by 15. 0.875. And basically what that's telling you is the expectation is for a one day, one standard deviation on this 11.84%. So that would be sort of, you know, the expected move. And I did take a look and I said, well, you know, everyone, when they start trading options, they said, well, I'm going to buy a straddle. Straddle just means you buy a call and you buy a put. You buy, you know, right around the at the money. At the money means it was trading at 125 uh, at the close. Actually, I think it was trading a little bit higher than that. Let me double check that. Yeah, it was trading at 125.61. So um, yeah, about 125 and a half. Just looking at, let's say, the 126 call, the 126 put that expires on Friday. At the end of today, it was roughly 13 and 13.75, 14 dollars to buy that. And so what that means is you would, in order to break even on that, let's just round up, you would need the stock to go up to uh, 139.61, almost 140, or the stock to go down to about 111.61. So we'll see if the straddle buyers, uh, you know, yet to be determined whether they make or lose money on that. Depends what happens in the next two days. Of course, implied volatility will get sucked out of this uh, this option chain because now the news is out. The news is out. And uh, so we'll see what happens. And sometimes the market underprices expected volatility, meaning you could have bought the straddle or a call or a put and the move is higher than expected. And if you got the the side right, okay. Uh, sometimes it underprices volatility. So it prices it high and then there really wasn't much of a move. So we'll we'll see what happens on this one. Again, the aftermarket is it's tough to really gauge until the uh, you know until the buyers come in or sellers the next day. Um, not making any predictions on that. So that's kind of an interesting thing to look at. I always look at the options market, I look at the earnings report, and then it's I haven't had a chance to listen to it or if it is going on now, the conference call. And especially for the bigger stocks, because sometimes they give little nuggets in the conference calls. And, you know, this is a, a company that certainly is a big deal with regard to the indexes because of the weighting that it has in those indexes. So definitely one that, uh, that everybody watches. All right, let's go over to the Fed and rates. I said, you know, the news is out. I mean, the Fed meeting hasn't happened yet, but Jay Powell, we talked about the good ship, transitory uh, I should get a t-shirt with that on it. I really shouldn't. I don't, people would be like, why are you wearing a shirt that says that? They, they wouldn't understand it. We would understand it, but, but they wouldn't. But he came out and he said, yeah, the time is now to adjust policy. So we know that uh, for a while, it looked like 
the market was pricing in 50 basis points of cuts. That's no longer. It's uh, There's only a 36% chance of more than a 25% basis cut, which would be one quarter point. Seems like that's where the market is settling in for the, the meeting on the 18th. Now, there is uh, about a 70% probability of a 50 basis point cut at the November meeting. So yeah, I mean, depending upon what he says at the press conference, that could drive things one way or another as far as the expectations, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So one of the things that I think is kind of interesting, and look, I mean, I'm not telling you to put your money into this or not put your money into it. It's not the direction I'm going. I do think it's interesting though that I feel like I'm starting to hear not only from market professionals or the talking heads or you know people go on the shows or just general people in, in finance, but I'm also starting to hear from sort of the everyday investor. And the thing I'm hearing is everybody knows the Fed is going to lower rates. Everyone knows that rates are going down. Everyone knows that I should be buying, I'm quoting now, I should be buying longer term bonds because if the Fed lowers rates, the bond prices go up. Remember, bonds have sort of an inverse with rates. And that's true. There's the seesaw. Rates go down, bond prices go up. 2022, you might remember the longer term bonds are the ones hit the most because they have what's called duration risk. And duration is a function of the coupon rate, the current interest rate, the time to maturity. And when you have a 30-year bond and rates go up, that's the one that's going to go down the most. Something that only has a year left isn't going to move that much. And But I, I am hearing this sort of common refrain now that's seeping in and it's, hey, I should be buying a bunch of bonds. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, let's go to the 10-year treasury. The 10-year treasury... The last yield I saw is right about 3.83, So that's the, the annual yield. And I'm just looking at a chart for sort of the generic, you know, US 10-year treasury bond. And I guess technically it's a, it's a note. It's a treasury note. Bonds are further out in maturity. And of course, bills are uh, the nearest, nearest maturities. So to put this in perspective, in 2020, if I look right kind of in 2020, you know, exactly four years ago-ish, you know, rates were 0.65%. We know that they hit a high almost to 5% in, when was that? October of 23. Uh, they went up and they they started to, I mean, they, they almost got to 4.7% in April of, of 2024. But it seems like the, the upper trajectory, certainly of rates, has, has abated. So what about this thing? Is this, is this kind of a crowded idea or is this going to become a crowded trade? And I think it's important to remind people that the Fed controls the front end of the curve. The Fed is raising or lowering the Fed funds rate. And that is just the overnight rate and it's, you know, the, the effective Fed funds right now, the rate is about 5.3 for 3%. Uh, the target is five and a quarter to five and a half. So the Fed has these, they call them target ranges or target bands. And usually the effective Fed funds rate trades in between there. So that's the, the near money, the, the nearest short-term money. And if the Fed, let's say, lowers that rate, Let's say they lower it from five and a quarter, five and a half to five to five and a quarter. What happens? Well, the Fed funds rate will uh, normally come down and and be somewhere within that range. The effective Fed funds, what, what people are actually doing the overnight transactions at. So let let's sort of take uh, you know the the midpoint there and pretend it's oh, I don't know five five point one three or something like that. So somewhere around there. So what does that do to the far end of the curve? Remember, they're, they're just touching the, the front end, the Fed funds rate. And yes, we've seen 
the 10-year treasury come back down. It's no longer hitting its head against 5% like it was in October of 23. Inflation is abating. Remember, inflation is permanent. Prices are embedded. Prices never really go down, but the rate of change is slowing. Uh, that seems to be the, the trend, and I don't necessarily have a, any reason to, to argue with that right now. And that's the prevailing sentiment as well. But what happens to these 10-year bonds? And the reason why the 10-year bond is interesting is because a 10-year bond is a great proxy plus a margin for 30-year mortgage rates. And I've talked about this in the past that historically, it, you add about you know 1.7% onto the 10-year, and that's about where the 30-year mortgage rate will be. And it's that spread is much higher right now. Part of the reason, I think, without going into a, a long diatribe on MBS securities or mortgage-backed securities, uh, I think there's some reasons for that, why that spread is wider. But let's just say that you know, you could have mortgage rates come down without the Fed doing anything, uh, or you know, they could come down if that spread narrows back to where it, it historically has been. It may not get back to its historic levels, but just because the Fed is lowering rates doesn't mean ten-year Treasury bonds or thirty-year Treasury, thirty-year uh, Treasury bonds or twenty-year Treasury bonds or five-year, they have to come down. Let's sort of play this out. Let's say that the Fed. Over the next, uh, oh, I don't know, let's say they they lower five times. And it could be five different rate cuts across five different meetings, or maybe it's a 50 basis point or whatever. So let's say they, they lower five times. W- what does that do? Well, it's uh, that gets you to four to four and a quarter as the target. So if the front end is four, and what would you expect the tenure to go to? Sure, we could still be inverted. It would be a pretty long time. It's already a long time to be inverted, but we could be inverted still. And you could have the 10-year treasury start to go down. But I just the reason I bring this up is this is kind of a crowded idea. I don't know what bonds are going to do. And if you want to buy bonds, you buy bonds. If you want to buy long duration bonds, buy those. If you want to bet against it, do it. You know, I this is why we sort of buy and hedge. We buy the equity markets. We do use bonds in some of our strategies, like our, we call it ZBIG, our buffered index growth strategies, which are buffered. And we have a, a layer of very short duration high yield that we use in there. We use US Treasury bills or Treasury notes or other items, other treasuries in some of our buy and hedge retirement strategies, where we're synthetically owning the market, but then we also have a a component, a layer of, of treasuries that kick off yield and help to, to pay for the protection. So we use those. But I think it, I'm going to be very interested to see what happens with this part of the curve. And I would say these instruments have already started pricing in cuts in the front end of the curve. The other aspect is with some of the something like the 10 year, something you know further out. It's more of a proxy for growth. And I think there was a study, I wish I could find it, where if you looked at not, you know, GDP, and this is one of my pet peeves, sometimes you do a real number, meaning adjusted for inflation, and sometimes you don't. Retail sales, when they they post that headline, not adjusted for inflation. That's a nominal number. When you they push out GDP, GDP is a is a real number. It's real GDP. It's adjusted for inflation. And so, but when you look at nominal GDP growth, and that's not adjusted for inflation. And I I think I remember the study was something like when you look at a 10 year period of nominal GDP growth, and you look at the the yield at, you know, around the start of the the period, that's that's sort of it's very close nominal GDP uh, to to the 10-year treasury yield. I'll have to try and find that study. So yeah, there is a growth component here. So we'll see. I just, it's your public service announcement. Like think think it through when you're looking at, especially if you're committing uh, a lot of money to some of this stuff. It's, it's really the prevalent sentiment right now. 
And I think you've got to understand it's a little more complicated because you have different points in the curve that will act differently. They don't have to go up or down at the same time. And who's to say that rates won't go down? And, you know, if rates go down, what does that mean for the economy? Like if there's, I think in historically, if there's a real problem in the economy and a real problem in markets, you might see a flight to quality. And flight to quality means buying bonds and buying bonds normally means pushing the yield down. So we'll see about that. But there you go. Hopefully that's helpful. All right. The other thing that was on my list to, to talk about, somebody asked me if I was going to talk about this. Hindenburg Research came out with a, a report on Supermicro and Supermicro Computer. And Hindenburg Research is a, a firm that puts out uh, normally, I, I shouldn't say normally, I, I shouldn't speak like that because I don't, I don't know for sure. But they normally, oh, they said it again, they often, you'll hear them in the news, there you go, when they put out a bearish report on a company one of their famous ones. What what was the one? It it was the company that did the uh, the electric trucks, and I think they they alleged that for a video the truck wasn't driving. They actually were towing it, made to look like it was driving. What was that company? I I can't think of the company now. It, it will come to me. But Hindenburg Research put out a a you know I. A, a bad report, let's say, on Supermicro Computer. And I'll touch on some of the th- things they said. I, I haven't had a chance to read it. And longtime listeners know that, although sure, I can look at discounted cash flows, I can look at balance sheets, I can, I can do sort of stock research. I'm, I don't consider myself a stock analyst. I'm not as familiar with this company as people who are commenting on it today. But I can tell you that Supermicro during the regular session was down 104.15 points which is minus 19.02%, and the aftermarket is down another 5.86%. And I'll put a link in the show notes to the the report so you can just read it. And I'm not sure on their website if they have prior ones, Uh, but their their TLDR, which is the too long, didn't read acronym. I think that's what the, uh, the cool kids are using. They are, quote, all told, we believe Supermicro is a serial recidivist, uh, it has benefited as an early mover, but still faces significant accounting, governance, and compliance issues, and offers an inferior product and service now being eroded away by more credible competitors, end quote. And uh, so, you know, you can read this. They basically, uh, I think I saw that the 10K was going to be delayed. That's kind of the some of the financials that come out. Um, they were... Another quote here, our three-month investigation, which included interviews with former senior employees, as well as experts, as well as a review of litigation reference. Anyway, I'll let you read this. I haven't had a chance to look at it, and I don't don't necessarily do individual stock analysis like this, but Supermicrocomputer had started the year in the Russell 2000, but now I'm trying to remember when that was. When did they get put in the S&P 500? But they got promoted to the S&P 500. And so this is, uh, you know, this is a short seller. Usually they are taking a bearish position and they publish research. I don't know if they put on the position before or after they do the research. But anyway, I'm not going to comment too much about it because I I just haven't read it. And I I wouldn't even know what to tell you to do with the stock if you own it or don't own it. So, but it, it is really interesting. There's a documentary on... I think it might be the same people, the same owner. I, you know, I could be wrong, but uh, these short sellers, if you Google the documentary, I think it's called Muddy Waters. They talk about, uh, you know, short sale research and things like that. So anyway, I put a, I'll put a link in the show notes to it. But yeah, that, that definitely uh, it hurt the market today a little bit because it's, well, it's not, you know, the weighting in the S&P 500 is not NVIDIA. It's still in the S&P 500 now, so there you go. Oh, it just came to me. Nikola. That was the, uh, that was the company. And uh, I remember they, they put out a report. I don't know. It might have been 20, 2021. Might have been, might have been 2020, now that I think about it. They released something that basically accused the company of um, making their truck – 
I already said it was they, they supposedly it was a non-functioning prototype, and they alleged I think that they put out a video that showed the, implied the the truck was driving on its own, and it turned out it was uh, I think it was being towed or something like that. So anyway, there you go. But Google uh, Hindenburg Research if you want to go down a rabbit hole and start reading uh, about that. They also, I think they also put out stuff on Icon, Carl Icon's company, which, what was it there? Um, I don't, again, I, I don't remember the details, but I think there were loans against the assets and they, they alleged that uh, the assets weren't being accounted for correctly. Anyway, read, read that. I'll put a link to it and from there, go down the rabbit hole. Last thing I'll say is, you know, just um, going back to sort of the NVIDIA earnings and then, uh, you know, trying to play these short-term moves. Should you buy NVIDIA? Should you not? I mean, here's the thing. If you are an investor and like we buy the market, we use the S&P, we use the, the SPY, and then we, we have different strategy. We use options on the S&P and create buffers. I mean, if, if you're sort of an investor and you own the S&P, you already own NVIDIA. You already own it. And the nice thing about indexes or indices, I guess indexes, are that they're sort of self-fulfilling uh, things as company, you know, you're sort of buying more of the companies that are going up. So there's, there's momentum in, in that index and, and you're selling things that are, you know, going down. So there is some momentum NIST to those. And you're also adding new companies into the index and shedding other ones. There's a there's a whole board that does that. Maybe we'll do a show on that, just explaining that process. And that changes the, you know, because the all the earnings are aggregated together in, in the indexes. So, you know, if, if you own the index, you already own these things. And trying to time earnings announcements is just good luck with that. That's why we buy the market. We hedge. It's the primary thing we do, we hedge the the downside. Still, hopefully, capture a majority of the upside, and then we also, you know, we buffer. So we say, hey, you know, I don't want to lose on the equity side more than X. I don't want to lose anything for the first X percent down, and then, so you know, if you want information on that, Derek Moore at ZegInvestments.com is the way to do that. Do me a favor. Uh, you can five star us. You can review us. Only good reviews. Only five stars. If not, don't bother. Um, focus on somebody else's podcast. But do share these with someone, uh, whether it's an investor or somebody new to investing. Share a link. Just go ahead and share it. And the other thing I'll tell you too is, if you're listening to this on a web browser, and I know we put it out on the uh, the ZigInvestments.com uh, site. We usually publish it as a blog article, a link, or an embedded player. But your best listening experience is going to be downloading a podcast app. And that could be the Spotify app. It could be Apple Podcast app. You search under Broken Pie Chart, subscribe. That way, you, you basically, you get the notice. And immediately when it's uh, it's published, you don't have to, to wait. And, uh, you know, you, it, you don't have to use those apps. You can use... Uh, any apps that you want, uh, you know, whatever your favorite podcast app. Amazon has one. There's, uh, you know, there's any number of third-party ones that are pretty good. I think I use Pocket Cast, and I started using them, and they I seem to like that one. I use some of the other ones too. So that's my public service announcement number two. If you're listening to this and you're clicking on it in a browser, and sometimes you know the the browser shuts down, you got to reopen it. Do yourself a favor, download a podcast app, make sure you search for it, subscribe for it. That way you know when the new episodes are coming out. And uh, if you find time to, to go ahead and, and share the link to one of our episodes, I'd appreciate it. And Jay would appreciate it. And Jay would be back next week. And we'll come back next week and we'll figure out what else we're, uh, we got right and what we got wrong. See everyone. <laughs>